to the next speaker, Professor Atul Goer. He has been quoted many, many times before he started speaking. So let's uh, hear to his presentation. Uh, okay. Atul, you can share the screen. Yeah. You, you know, <clears throat> so you have to make all, it Please share yeah. your screen. Yeah, but uh, you know what, uh, Mehmet, I'm not able to, yeah, yeah, no, no, yes. Good, it is there. Okay. Thank you, my dear friends. I see some very old and new friends on the screen and I'm very happy to talk to you all. And uh, I was listening to the wonderful presentation of my dear friend Max, Professor Max awesome. Milano. And I was reading the questions asked by the various people. And I have a feeling that I will have a lot of difficulty in explaining my concept. But what I intend to do in this presentation is to present to you a new concept called central or axial, atlantoaxial instability. That is my main purpose of this presentation. So as we have seen Chiari malformation, or I like to call it, as you have seen here, Chiari formation, as Professor Massimiliano also said, I do not like this word malformation. So this is a very common clinical event Syringomyelia is very commonly associated with Chiari malformation, basal invagination, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, syringobulbia. Now, before I go to my slides, I want you to check on my slides and I give you one concept that the posterior fossa is not tight. You see the subarachnoid spaces here? huge subarachnoid spaces in all the cases. I want to, you to see my slides, okay? So basilar invagination, syringomyelia, you see the subarachnoid spaces, it is not tight. Posterior fossa is not tight in 100% cases. Basilar invagination, carry malformation, syringomyelia is a common clinical triad. This kind of manifest atlantoaxial instability, like atlantodental interval increase, is a relatively uncommon event. See the posterior fossa, not tight. <clears throat> now there are two situations. One is when there is carry malformation associated with basal invagination, and when there is carry malformation without basilar invagination or without any bone malformation at the craniovertebral junction. The question is, are these two entities different? That is one question. The question number two is, is the treatment different? So before I go further on this, I have to say, that basilar invagination with or without carry with or without syringomyelia are children of the same father and that father's name is atlantoaxial instability. So they are the same children, same family. As we have heard, carry malformation is treated by a huge number of ways. Posterior fossa craniectomy, C1 laminectomy, C2 to laminectomy, dural opening, pericranial graft, Gore-Tex graft, metal implantation, small opening, big opening, very big opening. If you read the literature, every neurosurgeon in the world has a different technique. And every neurosurgeon in the world thinks that his technique is the best. The problem is nobody knows exactly why is Chiari malformation? What is Chiari malformation? Everybody knows the treatment, but nobody knows what is Chiari malformation. So let me try to introduce this subject in my own ways and in my experience, which is 
no? about four decades, about 40 years experience in this subject. As you know, I recently introduced this concept about eight years ago. Is atlantoaxial instability the cause of Gary malformation? So this, this is the title. And is atlantoaxial fixation the treatment? So I had written about 65 patients in the year 2013. And now in the subsequent seven, eight years, my experience is about 400 cases. And I have to tell you, my dear friends, I have no doubt in my mind that atlantoaxial instability is the cause of carry malformation. The problem is that atlantoaxial fixation in these conditions is not an easy surgical procedure. We have to learn how to do atlantoaxial fixation. And if you do atlantoaxial fixation, you will see something which I like to call magic. Magic. You have never realized the magic without doubt, without question, magic. Only one thing is there. You have to learn how to do C1, C2, very solid fixation. You cannot do a flimsy fixation. Is carry a formation or is it a malformation? Is it pathological or is it a protective phenomenon? I have to say without question, without doubt in my mind that it is a natural divine formation. It is introduced in its place to protect the neural structures from compression against the bones in the event of potential or manifest atlantoaxial instability. I also want to introduce to you, my dear friends, one fantastic revolution, fantastic revolution in not only for craniovertebral junction issues, but for degenerative spine, for OPLL, for Hirayama disease, for a range of problems, the concept of central or axial atlantoaxial instability. So please, please try to understand what I'm trying to say because I have no doubt. And please, if you have, this is a good forum for us to discuss. The only parameter to identify atlantoaxial instability was this atlantodental interval. If the, in dynamic images, the atlantodental interval increases, that is the only parameter in the literature for last 50 years to suggest atlantoaxial instability. We had introduced the parameter of facetal lysthesis facet of C1 lysthesis over facet of C2 as an additional parameter to determine the presence of atlantoaxial instability. And we had written long time ago that when there is an unstable spine, you have to stabilize and you have to fix. There is no need for decompression and you will all agree with that. And there is no confusion. When there is such an instability that you see the treatment is stabilization, there is no need to do any kind of decompression. So the concept that we had introduced is that facetal instability, C1 over C2. So this article of mine, which was published about 15 years ago, was an additional parameter to atlantodental interval instability. And we said that basilar invagination is nothing but C1 over C2 lysthesis, like lumbosacral lysthesis. You treat basilar invagination like you treat lumbosacral lysthesis. So we have talked about it for a long time that facetal lysthesis is the cause of basilar invagination. And when there is facetal lysthesis, there is need for treatment by stabilization and there is no need for decompression. And you will all agree that when there is carry malformation and syringomyelia, in presence of manifest atlantoaxial instability, in presence of lysthesis. Nobody in the world will do decompression. Stabilization is the treatment. There is no question about it, and there is no disagreement about it. So when there is basilar invagination with atlantodental interval disturbance with lysthesis, you all agree with me, and there is no confusion. 
that stabilization is the treatment and there is no need for decompression. So that is one thing which is not in question. I want to introduce to you, my dear friends, another concept, another classification of instability. Now you very carefully see these slides. This is the type one dislocation where the facet of atlas is dislocated anteriorly over the facet of axis and there is atlantodental interval disturbance, there is cord compression, there is facetal listhesis, you see facetal listhesis, and the treatment is atlantoaxial stabilization. You all agree in presence of atlantoaxial instability, there is no need for decompression, there is need for stabilization. Now you carefully see this slide. Here you see the facet of atlas is behind the facet of axis behind. There is no problem in atlantodental interval. There is no disturbance here. There is no cord compression. There is no cord compression. In this situation, the whole world today will do foramen magnum decompression. And I am telling you, this treatment of foramen magnum decompression is an absolutely wrong treatment in the presence of such instability you need to do atlantoaxial stabilization for such huge basilar invagination. Now you see, please see this another one, type three. When there is Chiari malformation, when there is syringomyelia, when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, even when there is a facetal alignment, it suggests the presence of an unstable spine and it suggests the need for atlantoaxial stabilization. There is no need to open the bone or do any decompression. There is no need to do any syringostomy. You see the syringe size has reduced. So this is a controversial thing for you. And I wish I can explain to you and give a clear message to you that all these three entities are unstable and carry malformation is a manifestation of an unstable craniovertebral junction. The only problem is it is a difficult operation. So I have learned over the period of time, I said for about 40 years, my experience in this subject, in the year 1998, we had written this article, which is very highly cited, that basilar invagination is of two types. In one, the odontoid goes up, in the second, the tonsil comes down. So this was my classification in the year 1998, my understanding. And the whole world's understanding was that these are fixed problems. There is no unstable. This is not unstable. This is not unstable. Decompression is the treatment for mouth or nose. And foramen magnum decompression is the treatment. I had mentioned myself in this article and this classification I had given, which is a very highly cited article. And this classification is also universally accepted classification. In the year 2004, we said that type one, where the odontoid goes up, is an unstable atlantoaxial joint. And type two, where the tones still come down, is a fixed problem and you need to do decompression. So in 2004, we said that these patients need transoral decompression and these patients need foramen magnum decompression. No, these patients need, these are unstable patients and they need stabilization. And we introduce a beautiful term called craniovertebral junction realignment. So these patients are unstable. These patients are stable in 2004, my concept. And then all of you know this concept of mine, which is quite a popular concept, that there is in this kind of basal invagination, there is no need to do any decompression. There is a need to do craniovertebral junction realignment. So when there is a basal invagination, open the joint, distract the facet, and realign the craniovertebral junction. There is no need to remove the odontoid, no need to remove the foramen magnum. Realignment is the treatment. So now we have got several hundred cases of this type where no decompression is done. And if you ask me today, 
will you ever do transoral surgery in your life? I will say never, never, as other than tumors, of course, cordomas and things like that. But for this kind of basilar invagination, transoral surgery in my department has not been done for last 15 years. This is a historical, completely no need. So you please accept this. I know it is difficult. In this article in 2004, we had said, I had said myself, first time, first time in the literature that type B needs, there is a small posterior fossa in the, and in the vertical height, in the height, not in the anterolateral and anteroposterior perspective, and decompression is the treatment. And I had said myself, that the opening of dura is not necessary in this article in, two, in 2004, in 1998. And I had published this article in quite a long time ago in 1995. You can see this, that when there is carry malformation, you can do an alternative technique of decompression where you open this bone and reverse this bone and I called it foramen magnotomy. And I was myself doing foramen magnum decompression for several years. I know what is foramen magnum decompression. I know what is syringostomy. I know what is syringostomy shunt. And I have seen these patients. And today I tell you, all these operations are absolutely not necessary. We said that the dura is like a condom or dura is an expansive structure. It, it is mother dura, dura matter. It can, com, it, it, it can hug the child, but never compress. So dura matter, there is no need for opening of the dura. This concept for the first time in the literature we had mentioned. Now I discuss about this entity of central or axial atlantoaxial instability. I said type one, where the facet of atlas goes in front and there is atlantodental interval disturbance that I call type one. The symptoms in type one are acute. Let me go back, wait. <clears throat> Let me go back to that classification. I want to show you again that classification here. So this is type one where there is atlantodental interval disturbance the symptoms in type one, now please listen to this carefully. Symptoms in type one are acute. Type two and type three, there may not be any atlantodental interval disturbance. May not be, but may, but may be. Type two and type three are chronic situations, chronic atlantoaxial instability. Acute, chronic and type two and type three, we said that these two types are called central or axial atlantoaxial instability because there is no atlantodental interval disturbance and there is no compression of the neurals or dural structures by the odontoid. So type two and type three are chronic, long-standing atlantoaxial instability which results in syringomyelia and carry malformation and a host of other problems, which I will discuss with you. So this entity of central or axial atlantoaxial instability in my view is a complete revolution in the field of craniovertebral junction surgery and not only craniovertebral junction surgery, but cervical degeneration, Hirayama disease, OPLL, and several other problems. So this is published on several occasions. So in central or axial atlantoaxial instability, it is a chronic phenomenon. The instability may be for 15 years, for 20 years, or for the whole life. And when there is chronic atlantoaxial instability, Nature plays its games. There are a host of reparative mechanisms, protective mechanisms, God's mechanism, which protect the human being 
from the effects of an unstable atlantoaxial joint and from an from the difficulties that can be posed by the odontoid process. In the presence of chronic atlantoaxial instability, there are a host of musculoskeletal alterations like short neck, torticollis, clipple file abnormality, bone fusions, C1 assimilation, C2-3 assimilation, platybasia, a host of musculoskeletal abnormalities can be natural protective mechanisms as a response to central or axial atlantoaxial instability. You do atlantoaxial stabilization the neck will become long, the neck will become straight. There is a potential for bone fusions to unfuse and the entire human being, you will give a new and beautiful smile that he has never, there, nobody has ever seen this smile in the lifetime. And in the evening of operation, when you go to see this child or an adult, you will see a different human being. You see this, although there is no smile on this child's face, but you see a long neck, a straight neck in the evening of operation. You see the, there are dressing is of the traction is still there and the neck is straight. So these, all these musculoskeletal abnormalities of torticollis, short neck, there is no need for any osteotomy here. There is no need for any kind of bone work there is no need for any kind of decompression and you find a beautiful new life. Not only the neck, the symptoms of the limbs, hands and legs completely cured and not cured, completely new life in the evening of operation. You see this long neck, straight neck, all this, you see the dressing is still on and the neck has become long and straight. So there are a host of musculoskeletal problems which are due to atlantoaxial instability and they get cured very soon. You see this quite a naughty little boy and I didn't like his hairstyle. So I thought, let me shave him. But he said, sir, please take care of my neck also. So I straightened his neck as well. And you see, there is quite a beautiful smile. This smile is beautiful on the face of the child, much more beautiful in the face of the relatives. They find and they get a new human being in the evening of operation. Bifid anterior and posterior arch, this article of mine says that bifid anterior and posterior arches of atlas are dynamic. You do flexion, it opens, you do extension, it closes. So there is a dynamic kind of process and bifid is not an embryological problem. It is a natural protective phenomena in the presence of atlantoaxial instability. You see there is a bifid arch of atlas. So when you see bifid, you don't have to do any in investigation. Don't do any investigation when there is a bifid it means there is atlantoaxial instability. It means there is need for stabilization. Another beautiful concept, cervical fusions. You see multi-level cervical fusion? I say that multi-level cervical fusion are a protective phenomena in response to craniovertebral junction instability. You see multi-level spinal fusions. This is not an embryological problem. This is a reparative procedure. They are natural protective phenomena in the event of atlantoaxial instability and you need to stabilize the atlantoaxial joint and you will get remarkable clinical recovery. There is in this patient, there is also bifid. So bifid arch of atlas, multi-level fusions are indicator of natural protection 
in the event of atlanto axial instability even when there is no compression you see there is no compression at all zero compression this patient will get a new life after you do atlanto axial fixation you see this in extension in flexion there is no compression at the cranio vertebral junction multi level fusions you do atlanto axial stabilization and this child has got a new life and this child was a daughter of a very senior press reporter and this case was reported very heavily in the indian news this patient was not able to breathe before operation and this patient has got a new life there is no compression compression presence of compression is not the issue there are reparative mechanisms by nature and all these short neck torticollis bone fusions are all reparative and they indicate the presence of atlanto axial instability so we said that all basilar invaginations are unstable and all basilar invagination needs stabilization so you can see from 1998 i have come a long way and now i say that all these patients need stabilization and all this work is very heavily published in the literature i wish you can see my experience in this subject of selective atlanto axial fixation is more than 2600 cases and i had published group a and group b treatment by atlanto axial stabilization so this kind of basilar invagination you see is not a problem this is not an embryological abnormality this is a natural phenomena so basilar invagination as a phenomena is due to atlanto axial unstable spine you don't need to do decompression from front or from behind you need to do atlanto axial stabilization that is the treatment don't have confusion please don't have confusion and if you have confusion you should learn the technique and if you have a problem you please come and visit me and not more than 2 weeks i will make you an expert in this operation basilar invagination you see very it is not an easy operation such basilar invagination to open the facet to open the joint to remove the cartilage to introduce bone graft and to do c1 c2 fixation not easy but this is the treatment for all kinds of basilar invagination so i say my dear friends that basilar invagination is a natural protective musculoskeletal response of god of nature to protect the human being from atlanto axial instability you see such huge basilar invagination today i tell you the whole world will do foramen magnum decompression there is a clear cut presence of an unstable spine and you this patient needs a beautiful operation of atlanto axial stabilization and you take my word and take the word very with great humility and great respect for all of you i please take my word in the evening of operation this patient will get a brand new life so this is you can sometimes see this kind of facetal whether you see unstable spine whether you see facetal abnormality or not presence of basilar invagination indicates the need for atlanto axial stabilization early in my experience i used to do occipital fixation we were the first one to describe occipital screws in the literature and we used to do on quite a regular basis decompression and fixation today i say that there is no need for occipital fixation at all there is no need for decompression at all but if you are not able to do atlanto axial fixation this may be a suboptimal operation but this may be the only option in front of you this was the editorial i wrote occipital cervical fixation is it necessary i am saying inclusion of the occipital bone has been completely abandoned in my operation theater for at least 15 years basilar invagination and syringomyelia and chiari malformation are the children of the same father and that father is atlanto axial instability chronic atlanto axial instability will lead to musculoskeletal abnormality that are combined and they are 
called a basilar invagination and neural abnormality that are called syringomyelia and carry formation. They may be present together and they may be present discreetly or separately. Whether they are present together or whether they are present separately, they all indicate the presence of an unstable atlantoaxial joint. Syringomyelia is helpful. I heard my dear friend Max talking about syringomyelia and various kinds of shunts. Believe me, with my experience of last 40 years, I have completely abandoned any kind of manipulation of syringomyelia. My concept is, which this paper was published in 1996, syringomyelia is helpful and not harmful. Any kind of manipulation of syrinx is a negative phenomenon. Similarly, carry formation is always a response to atlantoaxial instability. Even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, even when there is no facetal malalignment, this is an indicator of an unstable atlantoaxial joint and an indicator for need for atlantoaxial stabilization. There is no other treatment. Whether there is basilar invagination or not, whether there is syringomyelia or not, whether there is bone fusion here or not, whether there is any kind of other bone abnormality or not, whether there is atlantodental interval disturbance or not, or facetal malalignment or not, atlantoaxial stabilization is the treatment. And now I will show you several cases. You see there is no atlantodental interval disturbance. There is mild type two kind of an unstable atlantoaxial facet. There is quite a bit of syringomyelia. There is chiari malformation. So you must see the facets. Only fixation, and you see the syrinx has gone, and there is no foramen magnum decompression. And believe me, my dear friends, believe with great humility and respect to all of you, I say, this patient will get a new life in the evening of operation. Whether there is syringomyelia or not, whether there is basilar invagination or not, whether there is assimilation of atlas or not, presence of Chiari malformation and syringomyelia is an indicator of an unstable spine. You do atlantoaxial stabilization, no decompression, syringomyelia disappears. You will ask me how many times syringomyelia disappears. I will say 100% of time if you do a MRI after one year. And about 50% of time if you do MRI after three months. No question. No question, the need for syringostomy or syring shunt is an absolutely wrong surgical procedure. No question in my mind. You see huge syringomyelia, there is basilar invagination, carry malformation, there is not much facetal malalignment, there is not much atlantodental interval disturbance. I do atlantoaxial stabilization, the tonsil goes up, the syrinx reduces. I am telling you, whether there is basilar invagination or not, whether there is syringomyelia or not, whether syringomyelia is there without basilar invagination or carry or not, means sometimes only syringomyelia can be present, no tonsillar herniation. Sometimes only syringomyelia can be present without tonsillar herniation and basilar invagination. They are the children of the same father and mother, and that father is a very beautiful father, atlantoaxial instability. Preoperative images, you see syringomyelia, tonsillar herniation, no problem, little bit problem, you see the syringe has gone. Syringe gone or not gone is not the issue. Patient, new life, you give a new life. This operation, my dear friends, is not easy. Is not easy, it is difficult. Please learn this technique. Don't say it is bad because you cannot do it. Don't say this concept is rubbish because you cannot do it. Foramen magnum decompression, any resident of neurosurgery can do foramen magnum decompression. Easy operation. This is difficult operation. 
but we neurosurgeons, all the young neurosurgeons in the audience have come to neurosurgery. They want to do complex things. They want to do give new life to the people. You do this operation, you give new life to the patient without any question. Whether there is basal invagination or not, you see there is no problem here, no problem here. You see I have done a C1, C2 fixation. You see the syringe has reduced in the immediate post-operative period. Now I have got hundreds of patients like this. <clears throat> is carry a formation or a malformation? I said that tonsillar herniation is like nature's airbag. It protects the neck in event of an accident. And it is a big protective mechanism and carry malformation. You should not directly puncture this airbag. So there was there, as you know, many questions. Many people asked me several questions. Pediatric people said, no, this is not good. Some people said it works only in carry malformation, in basal invagination. And some people said that Indian human being is different. American human being is different. German human being is different. Means like a different animal. Like Indian human being is like a lion. And an American human being is like a uh, some other kind of animal, not lion, maybe horse. So this was all the, also the responses that I received. If you read this, they said that the Indian human being is a different human being. And these are various kinds of responses. So I produced this paper in Dr. Massimiliano's book that atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment of carry malformation even when there is no bone malformation in the craniovertebral junction. No bone malformation, atlantoaxial, you see the joint is a problem. <clears throat> no bone malformation or there is some bone malformation, you see there is, you do a, you do a C1, C2 fixation and you have a syrinx reduced, whether syrinx reduces or not, that is not the issue absolutely. The issue is whether the patient improves or not. Absolutely, my dear friends you get a new human being in the evening of operation without any question. Sitting, you see this sitting omalia. Don't say that Indian human beings are different. I get very thoroughly irritated by that. Tonsillar herniation, sitting omalia. No problem here, no problem here. You see, I think I have shown you this patient already. There is basal invagination and there is fixation. Sitting omalia reduces. You see, there is sitting omalia. There is no, there is tonsillar herniation and there is no serious problem here. And you see the syringomyelia reduces, there is an atlantoaxial fixation. Recently, I have published my experience with 388 cases in World Neurosurgery. I wish you can read that article just very recently published. Syringomyelia carry malformation. Do not do this. You see, there is no tight posterior fossa. There's a lot of subarachnoid space. You open the bone, open the dura. Believe me, my dear friends, very, very negative operation. And op open the obex and open the arachnoid. I used to do. I have introduced the concept that opening the bone is not, dura is not necessary. I used to do a lot of dural decompression. I introduced the concept that there is a vertical height reduction in cases of carry malformation. First time in the literature, Today I tell you that there is no question of tight posterior fossa. You need to do atlantoaxial stabilization and you give a new human being. You see another case of syringomyelia, no problem here, little bit problem here, and you see there is syringe reduction. Syringomyelia, tonsillar herniation, fixation, no decompression. Syringomyelia, no decompression. Now I have got 300, I have published 388 cases and I will give you another very beautiful, beautiful statistics. I produced 388, you read my article. I, am, I have written in my article 100% result. I have got 100% improvement in symptom. Can you write this for forum and magnum decompression? Do you have that courage to write? Because when I right 100% if one patient is not improved he can produce this in a very i can be in very serious problem 100% can you write it carry malformation syringomyelia you see the syringe has reduced 
when there is basal invagination, of course, there is atlantoaxial stabilization, syringe reduced. This is a difficult operation. There is no question about it. And you have to learn this technique beautifully. And there are various other secondary manifestations in the form of short neck, short head, short spine, short body in the event, which are all protective. I also introduce a new term called external syringe. There can be syringomyelia inside the cord, syringomyelia outside the cord, syringobulbia out, inside the bulb, outside the bulb. And these can be common. And these are new terms. This water is life. Water can never go wrong. Water can be inside the cord, outside the cord, inside the medulla, outside the medulla, inside the inside with association of tonsillar herniation, they are all natural protective maneuvering. When you're, this patient, a very elaborate engineer, and he had been shunted, and he had undergone several times forum and magnum decompression, shunt, EVDs, tethering, of detethering, 13 operations he underwent, and then I did atlantoaxial fixation. I gave this poor man from a village, a very intelligent man, a new life, and the syringomyelia has disappeared. This was the boy. There was a tube in the nose. There was, there was a catheter here. There was tubes everywhere in his body. He could not even sit with his neck straight. And he, immediately in the post-operative period, although he has catheter here, but this catheter was removed very soon. And this person has got a new life. I have got his video here, but you know, it is a way, I'm not sure if you can really appreciate these things in the very post-operative period when he was being taken home and from a very remote village, a poor man, but a rich man, he was then able to walk and he was not able to move, do anything here. There are some things which are pre-operative also here. You see this guy, I cannot show you how he's talking because he's talking in Indian language, <clears throat> but he could do nothing. So failed forum and magnum decompression, what you will do? Nobody knows. You will open some more dura. You will open some more bone. You will do some more CSF shunting. Please don't do it. Please try to understand. I am not trying to talk these things on a high pedestal or with ego and pride because you are students of neurosurgery. You are students of our great subject. We need to understand. When I wrote this paper, many pediatric neurosurgeons said, no, 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 it doesn't work in pediatric patients. I wrote this article in 33 patients, and if you read 100% improvement in various symptoms in a child, you see there is no problem here. There is some problem here, and I did C1-C2 fixation, and there is a reduction in the sh And these are the two pictures in the it, when he came for a follow-up after after I think one or two months, he could run beautifully. I gave this child a new life. I gave this mother a new smile. And I gave this a new birth to this human being. And there are several children in my series. I, you know, there is no question about the treatment. Idiopathic syringe, nobody in the world knows what is the treatment. I am saying syringomyelia is the child of the same father. Whether it is present in association with the tonsil. I saw one slide of Dr. Mass Milano and I would like to ask him what he would like to do. You do shunt, this patient is finished. You do any kind of hydrosphere shunting, EVD, finish. This patient is dead. Don't even see this patient. You give him new life and you see the syrinx is gone. And I reported nine cases long time ago. Now I have got several cases with idiopathic syrinx. This is the treatment. They don't have confusion in your mind. Kyphoscoliosis can be associated with syringomyelia. Very rapidly, I will show you, is another child of the same father, and that father is kyph here. So this father of atlantoaxial central instability has got several children all over the world, and that another is kyphoscoliosis. Is the, you see, the, the whole world will produce 200 screws here and one kilometer of rod on this side, one kilometer of rod this side, right up to the neck and right up to this part. But this patient does not need any, this kind of treatment. He needs stabilization. And you see, there is this turn and this turn in the very image. This after two or three months of surgery, 
This is no instrumentation here. Same father was treated. And this, you see this, uh, during operation, you have MEP improvement. So, and this central or actual Atlanta actual instability is a concept. Is a concept, is a revolution in our field of neurosurgery. You see, when there is this pa patient, there is no compression, no problem, but there is a presence of bifid. This patient has a central atlanto axial instability. You give this beautiful smile to this child and beautiful smile to this doctor, and this is possible. If you understand, you don't talk to me on a high pedestal. Indians are different and I am different and your group of patients is different. Please don't talk in that language. Please talk in a language which is common and which is scientific. Can forum and magnum decompression become historical? Absolutely, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Atul. Uh, very uh, contradictory views and very nice uh, presentation, really. Uh, there are many questions. Uh, <laughs> More, uh, I will ask one of them. Actually, what is your surgical strategy if there is a high riding vertebral artery in one side? Yeah, yeah. If there is high riding vertebral artery, I recently wrote one beautiful article that you can treat. Okay. You, if there is a high riding vertebral artery, so, sorry, can you unshare my screen, uh, Mehmet? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yes, it, yes. It, sorry, you, sorry. Only. Okay, good. If there is a high riding vertebral artery, you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to save it. You have to protect it. And there are various ways to protect high riding vertebral artery. And there are several articles of mine which discuss how to protect the high riding vertebral artery. That is not a, not a excuse not to do C1, C2 fixation. Uh, can I make a question? Yeah, please. Well, I have three technical questions. First one is the importance of traction for basilar imagination, pre-op. Traction. Second one is uh, Let me intraoperative. Okay. I use traction only during the operation. I don't give preoperative traction for basilar invagination. That is the answer to your question. Okay, number two. Number two is uh, uh, do you use uh, uh, intraoperative uh, image guided surgery, which means uh, OR navigation? There is no need. I have intraoperative, I have navigation in my department. I used to do some navigation earlier, but now you see, I have got an experience for several years, as you know, of doing this C1, C2 fixation. I do not do, but navigation is a good tool. You must, for the people who are not very familiar, they must use it. I will recommend. Uh, yeah, I, I would recommend it mostly for yes. even a resident can perform C1, yes. C2 during yes. the night. Yes. But the third one, which is, in my opinion, very important, is how do you perform fusion? My fusion is three-step surgery. I described 1988, I described C1, C2 fixation. My technique has three steps. Open the joint, remove the C1, C2 joint, remove the articular cartilage, okay. introduce bone graft in the joint, okay. then do fixation. If you do not do these three steps, you have not done a good operation. If you have to do a good operation, you have to do three steps. Open the joint, remove the cartilage, introduce bone graft inside the joint, and then do fixation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. There is one question uh, telling that if atlantodental interval is normal, and there is no obvious instability, don't you think C1, C2 C fixation is an over-surgery? Because fixation will decrease the neck movement. In some cases, supoxital craniectomy is enough for treatment. In such a case, 
why should we prefer fixation and uh, now you know what let me Mehmet, answer this question if, yeah. if you are asking this question to me after my lecture of at least half an hour it means you have not understood what i'm saying you are talking just because you want to be strong and you are talking you know you want to say that no i'm not trying to talk on high pedestal i'm saying that there is a concept of central instability you please try to understand if there is no atlantodental interval even then there is an unstable spine please try to understand yeah, if yeah. you do not understand please go ahead and do decompression i'm not stopping anybody right yeah yeah i, I mean uh... The, the, but in, in the question, there is a, with, with C1, C2 fixation, there may be some uh, restriction of the movements. No restriction. You see, the person is restricted. You know, in carry malformation, you can have breathing disturbance. You can have sound. You can have voice disturbance. You can have sleep apnea. You can have continuous pain in the neck. You have myelopathy pain. You have symptoms in the hands. In advanced cases, there may be symptoms in the legs. I am saying the person will get a new life in the evening of operation with minimal, if at all, if you are saying minimal restriction of neck, which nobody has ever questioned me. Yeah. Uh, in a related question, do you stabilize C1, C2 in neutral position or in specific angle? See, in uh, basilar invagination group A, where the odontoid goes up, I like to reduce that dislocation. But in most of these cases, it is the there is no, it is not a radiological manifestation. It is unstable spine. So three steps of operation, which I have said: open the joint, distract the facet, remove the cartilage, introduce bone graft, then fix. And there is no need to maneuver to reduce in in central instability. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I can probably ask Maximiliano uh, to make some comments. Uh, Mehmet, you should uh, unmute uh, his microphone. Ah, sorry, Massimiliano. Okay, thank you. Do you hear me right now? Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Sure. I'm sorry for that. I was speaking, but uh, I was convinced to be uh, effective for audio uh, transmission. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Atul, for your. Uh, Beautiful, outstanding, proud, proud uh, against uh, old fashioned friend. Um, and uh, this old fashioned friend is completely um, associated to the need to demonstrate instability, in order to stabilize some unstable uh, functional uh, spine unit. This is the old fashioned um, uh, primary uh, statement and suggestion to demonstrate inst instability in order to program, to plan, and to perform stabilization fusion. Your experience, you presume uh, that uh, instability is working under the um, Chiari and Syrinx uh, and uh, uh, pathology. And uh, I love uh, the way to call uh, uh, children and fathers. And uh, uh, I love the way to uh, define uh, uh, C1, C2 vertical instability like transatlantic. Uh, Transatlantic uh, C1 C2 instability. I am convinced uh, for a big part uh, of uh, your presentation that uh, uh, C1 C2 instability is uh, uh, the background for Chiari and Syrinx. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I underline nevertheless, not 100% of uh, 
Chiari said uh, in my personal experience and opinion are completely uh, depending from uh, C1, C2 instability. I still uh, uh, remember the hydrocephalus as driving force, the tether cord as driving force of some forms of Chiari and Schering's. And no doubt at all that uh, if you don't treat hydrocephalus and fix C1, C2, At least in my hydrocephalus, in hydrocephalus linked chiari uh, malformation settings, or with the tether the cord in some special uh, of uh, uh, tether cord uh, linked chiari. You don't rule out the diagnosis of chiari malformation from the one of the intracranial hypotension, and you. Fix these are these are special cases that go out of the circle of the paternity other uh, biological relationship within a father and children. No, we are not <laughs> always. Uh, children of the same father <laughs> as you as we know <laughs> and so we have to uh, underline that um, not 100 percent of a situation are related to only one etiology uh, as in uh, brain pattern uh, of uh, pathology pathology de derivation. And so in this uh, um, very intriguing and challenging uh, malformation uh, clinical pattern, we have to identify correctly the disease and its cause. And I congratulate uh, Atul for, as, for having introduc introduced a new concept very difficult, but very fascinating and very uh, new concept to deal with uh, Chiari and settings. Now, <clears throat> Mehmet, can I answer this question? Can I answer his comments, uh, Massimiliano's comments? See, the issue is, Massimiliano, yes. I'm not saying when there is tumor and carry, tethered cord and carry, hydrocephalus and carry, that you should do C1, C2 fixation. I don't know this entity of, uh, you know, intracranial hypotension. I don't know this because, you know, I always have hypotension in my head all the time. I don't know what is this. I don't understand this complex intracranial hypotension as a cause of carry. I don't know. But this carry is a different, this is a regular carry without any other associated problems in the spine or trauma related, if you ask me trauma related settings, tumor related settings, those are, you know, those are different. I'm talking of general carry, general settings, general problem. Yes, I, I was interpreting your concept of carry formation. Uh, because Chiari formation is a consequence of uh, uh, tonsillar herniation in some uh, in some situation, and I completely agree with you that uh, Chiari malformation doesn't exist, and Chiari formation as results of a compensatory mechanism, as a, a response of uh, a, 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 a pathophysiological mechanism, is very uh, convincing. 
and uh, we can uh, have uh, inflating of the hairback in different situations during uh, an, a car accident uh, or just when we manipulate uh, the uh, the car in a wrong manner or as, or as a simple accident uh, in three different situation the um, uh, uh, the um, this mechanism can uh, can uh, pop up and the problem is to identify the mechanism with uh, uh, the airbag uh, inflate uh, and to treat it or to prevent in some situation and i think that uh, uh, your philosophy is uh, right. completely correct Mehmet Mehmet Hocam mikrofonunuz kapalı. We can go to Dr. Solanki's lecture now. Yes, I think that uh, I, don't, I don't see Mehmet but uh, first uh, finally I want to give my personal compliment to Professor Goel. It was really something Out, outstanding and everybody realized it so thank you very much thank and now i will uh, like 